United States of America. Once nothing more than 4,000 million square miles of extreme wilderness. Today, it is home to over 330 million people. It dominates the world with its military might and financial power. As its influence can be felt in every corner of the globe. It's big, it's brash, it's bold. In this film, we look at the key moments in this remarkable country's life from a groundbreaking rebellion. At the time, the US was an experiment. Could the United States survive? To becoming the leader of the free world. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. If you could bottle what Reagan had, you'd be a millionaire. It is a story of infinite possibility. The land itself seemed to suggest that anything was possible. Of riches beyond your wildest dreams. There's gold in that dark path. That dream is, is real and of liberty for better and for worse. Everybody grieved differently. I hurt every day. But is America really the land of the free? How can you be a beacon for human freedom when you participate in the slave trade? And how did it transform into the monumental powerhouse we recognize today? Lift off. In just 1,000 years. Things happen that you never would even think would happen. America, 1,000 years ago. This breathtaking country is home to an ancient civilization. The people that we today call Native Americans had first migrated to the Americas about 15,000 years ago. They crossed over the Bering Strait from Asia. So they'd been living in what's now the United States for centuries. But this colossal continent could not remain a secret forever. Fast forward to 1492, when Christopher Columbus first caught sight of the New World. They were seeking fabled, promised lands of plenty where everything would just, you know, uh, run free and there would be this abundant wealth just waiting for them. As Europeans mastered the oceans, Others sailed in Columbus's wake. For generations, you have people crossing the Atlantic from Europe who are dreaming of America and the life it might give. The Spanish were the first to establish a permanent settlement in what we now know as Florida. The French soon followed, but the British were in hot pursuit. The first English men settled in what they saw as the New World in North America uh, in 1607, some who saw themselves as adventurers. They settled the colony of Jamestown in present-day Virginia. Given that they were men of leisure generally, they didn't have the skills or the knowledge to make a colony <laughs> survive. In about a decade, 80% had perished. And just at the point when it was looking like Britain's first North American settlement was going to fail, they find that they can grow tobacco. And all of a sudden, that colony begins to boom and grow. This first British colony opened a gateway to a new life. The first settlers had this sort of image of themselves as people who were fleeing the old world and they were building this shining city on a hill that was going to be a beacon to the rest of humanity. Everybody can live their dream. This is a land full of opportunities. And that's such a, a shaping influence on the United States. There is no better symbol of this than the Statue of Liberty. Towering over New York Harbor, it represents freedom and opportunity for all. It's the idea that no matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, you have a chance to start your life over in the United States. But was America really the land of the free? How can you talk about being a beacon for human freedom when you yourself participate in the slave trade? 
There is an inherent untruth in the idea of America as the land of the free, partly because of America's origins, how it, how it became a nation. The first African slaves came into the Jamestown colony in 1619. That first ship carried around 20 slaves. And therein really begins the history of slavery in America. George Washington was a slave owner. Thomas Jefferson, third president, was a slave owner. The phrase from the Constitution is, uh, all men are created equal. And it's there that we see the first inherent contradiction. Women are excluded. The indigenous population is excluded. Enslaved Africans are also excluded. That refusal to recognize the essential humanity of black people runs right the way through American history. The America we know today, one of the richest, most powerful democracies in the world, was built on the backs of slaves. If you want to become a world power, you can't go too far wrong by integrating a program of almost limitless free labor. In the 17th and 18th centuries, African slaves mainly worked on the tobacco plantations in the South. But by the early 19th century, this had given way to cotton plantations, as huge demand for cotton grew in America and Europe. They're trading by the mid-19th century in the millions of bales every year. And to actually meet that global demand, there is an increased demand for slave labor. It's an economic system as well. It's actually going to, in many ways, drive the destiny of the country. The property value of slaves increases too. Those who are seen as healthy and fit are considered prized possessions. A slave economy is what enables America to really begin to build the extraordinary wealth that it still benefits from today. By 1860, America's slave population had reached nearly four million resulting in an incredible explosion of the country's financial power. The collective wealth held in America's four million African-American slaves was roughly $3 billion, which was more than the combined value of all the railroads and the factories in the country combined. Slavery was deeply entrenched in the South, but in the North, it was a different story. The North becomes increasingly mechanized. Um, you see the emergence of a factory system. You have an increasingly industrialized North. There's less need for as many physical hands. The North do see a slave-based economy as part of the past. It's not where America is moving. By 1860, tensions over slavery had reached a fever pitch. And things escalated further when Abraham Lincoln was elected president. Lincoln was morally opposed to slavery. The white South fear that he will use his power to bring about the emancipation of the slaves and the destruction of their entire way of life. This is the point of no return. Convinced that the government would do all in its power to abolish slavery and sever the institution that drove their booming economy, 11 southern states broke away from the North. Together, they form a new country, the Confederate States of America. It has its own currency, its own government. And they make a new flag, a Confederate flag. For the United States, these individuals are traitors. They have torn the Union apart. The Civil War had begun. It would embroil America in a deadly battle, bringing into doubt its very survival. The question of slavery will now be settled in what became the nation's bloodiest war. America, 1,000 years ago. A rich and fertile land untouched by European settlement transforms itself into a rich and prosperous economy, but one built on the backs of slaves. And by 1862, the nation is on the cusp of the greatest change in its history. States and families are being torn apart in a bloody war over the fate 
of the country's future. There is no doubt that slavery was the fundamental cause of the war, but the abolition of slavery was not Lincoln's priority. That was preservation of the Union. The nation in world historical terms isn't even a toddler yet, right? And so the idea that it could in fact be riven by this ideological debate is what Lincoln and many others are desperate to avoid. Britain and France were ready to recognize the Southern Confederate States as a separate nation. Lincoln had to act. In January 1863, he issues the Emancipation Proclamation. This legislation declared that all slaves in active rebellion against the Union shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. He's saying, those individuals who are now free, you can come and join the Union and you can fight for us. This proclamation was a wartime measure. It's a war tactic. Nearly 200,000 African Americans would answer the call to fight against the South. Enslaved African Americans will now fight for their own freedom. The Civil War was the deadliest conflict in American history. It was brutal. It was, it was horrific. After four years of savage conflict, the Civil War finally ended in 1865. The Union had been saved, and in a landmark moment, the government passed the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. The 13th Amendment is the teeth to the Emancipation Proclamation. The abolition of slavery is monumental. They were no longer bound by the condition of their mothers to a life of enslavement in perpetuity. Finally, those famous words that all men are created equal may finally actually be fulfilled. The Statue of Liberty remains a testament to this huge turning point in America's history, as a broken shackle and chain sits at Liberty's feet to commemorate the abolition of slavery. The 13th Amendment ensured that African Americans would be forever free. But what it didn't answer was this set of thorny questions about what that freedom would actually look like. We now have four million more free individuals in the United States. So what are we going to do? How do we rebuild? In 1896, America tried to answer that question. But their answer would lead to yet more division, inequality, and bloodshed. After the Civil War, the United States enters into a period of about 10, 12 years called the period of Reconstruction. So Reconstruction is a partially successful experiment in securing um, newfound rights to former slaves. But it comes to an end prematurely because of white Southerners' determination to restore their dominion over the South. The South lost the war, but the ideology of white supremacy was not dislodged. And so they fight to make sure that the South remains under the rule of white supremacy. OK, we're all equal, but the races do need to remain separate. So the doctrine was known as separate, but equal. They needed that racial hierarchy. They needed that to be written into the law, and they did. In 1896, a landmark case made racial segregation the law of the land for the whole of the United States. The Supreme Court say if services are offered equally, it doesn't matter if they're racially segregated. And so you actually see a mushrooming of laws across the North and the South that begins to separate and partition the United States. One world for white individuals, another world for black individuals. And it covers everything that you can think of. Interracial marriage is banned. You cannot work together. 
you cannot eat together. We would have a black school and a white school, and we'd have one carriage in a railway car and nine where white people could sit. What I'm getting at here is that it was never equal. And so racial inequality finds new life. Segregation to the average Negro means being held back. He wants to move forward in the American mainstream. Segregation holds him back. America was now brutally divided along racial lines. Racial segregation was humiliating and degrading. You were not one of those individuals who lived in the land of the free. All of this would have uh, an enormous psychological effect on, on the African-American population, partly because if you fell foul of particular laws, um, the consequences would be dire. Intimidation and violence were used to prevent African-Americans going about their everyday lives and even from exercising their constitutional right to vote. You could be beaten. Your house could be burned down. You could be lynched. These are sadistic forms of violence. It's not just the physical oppression, it's the psychological oppression. That the threat of the violence was this long shadow cast over African Americans that conditioned their every move in public. The most ruthless and notorious organization that rose up during this period was the Ku Klux Klan, who unleashed a reign of terror on the black communities. The Ku Klux Klan is a terrorist organization. The mission of the Klan was the preservation of white people at the top of a racial hierarchy. I told the mayor here if he refused to negotiate the racial issue with the members of the Klan, then we would start an economic boycott against this city. Yeah! The Klan actually reaches its greatest power in the 1920s when it has several million followers. It's so powerful that its members are able to march publicly on the streets of Washington, D.C., in front of the nation's capital. With white supremacist organizations like the KKK and racial segregation enforced throughout the country, equality seemed impossible. But a global event was set to change the fate of America's black population. World War II is yet another turning point in this story of African-American freedom. During the war, 125,000 African-American soldiers were sent abroad to fight. And what they encountered while serving sparked a revolution. The experience of being stationed overseas is a moment of enlightenment for many African-American soldiers be they stationed in Britain or France or Italy, they experienced greater interaction between the races. They fought a war to liberate Europe, and yet they were returning home to a country that didn't bestow the same kind of rights and privileges to people of color. Many veterans, when they return home, seek to push for racial change and reform. They initiate the Double V campaign. We will fight fascism, abroad, and we will also fight racism at home. Really the precursor to what we'll see in the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. An event on the 5th of December, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, would become the critical moment in this burgeoning movement. Rosa Parks decided on that day in December that she would not give up her seat on the bus as was required by racial segregation laws. She was arrested and taken to jail. And the outcry in the black community that such a well-known and dignified woman had been jailed sparked the Montgomery bus boycott. For over a year, African Americans refused to use the buses in Montgomery, and they actually bankrupt the company, forcing them to come to the table to negotiate and to finally end practices of racial segregation on the buses. Rosa Parks became known as the mother of the civil rights movement. 
and the Montgomery bus boycott would also place young pastor Martin Luther King at the front and center. Martin Luther King is the icon of the civil rights movement. He had a way to connect with the nation, to tell the nation that you are not living up to what you defined yourselves to be. We will no longer sell our birthright of freedom for the mess of segregated pottage. The reason that he's so iconic is because of his philosophy of nonviolence. It's an extraordinary radical move to say, we're going to fight this injustice without violence. So that contrast becomes very, very powerful. Unlike the Civil War just a century earlier, peaceful protest would form the bedrock of the entire movement, which exploded in 1960. Students bring a vigor and an intensity that hasn't quite been witnessed before. The student sit-ins are simply an attempt to secure integrated seating at lunch counters across the South. They begin to occupy spaces where they are told you are not allowed to be. And they say, we're here and we're gonna stay. People would pour drinks over their heads. They were being told to sit quietly, to not retaliate, to do nothing. They are engaging in acts of non-violent civil disobedience. These students are actually breaking the law. On February 27, 80 Nashville students were arrested out of over 300. This is a new radical phase of protest that willing to peacefully defy laws that they can withstand the worst that the white power structure can throw at them. It's that sharper-edged protest that will bring about the civil rights revolution of the 1960s. When he called from the jail, he said, he said, be cool, mother. <laughs> and that was very uh, trying, and yet it was amusing, too. <laughs> By the late summer of 1963, more than 200,000 people marched on Washington. They gathered by the Lincoln Memorial, the very place where just four decades ago, the KKK had been allowed to protest. Their aim? To push through civil rights legislation and establish job equality for all. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. It's at that protest in Washington that King, standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, delivers his most famous speech, you know, the I Have a Dream oration. But that speech is far more than a dream. It's actually a critique of the United States. He's actually addressing the nation on the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Are African-Americans free 100 years later after Abraham Lincoln first said, yes, you are free? Martin Luther King says no. The nation has not lived up to that promise. Martin Luther King really understood the potential of the United States, and he pushed the United States to live up to what the founding fathers saw for the nation. The following year, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law, ending nearly a century of racial segregation, and the Voting Act, guaranteeing African Americans the right to exercise their vote, was passed 12 months later. It had taken over three centuries since the arrival of the first slaves in Jamestown to finally address the deep-seated problems that had blighted America. Congress passes the most sweeping civil rights bill ever to be written into the law, and thus reaffirms the conception of equality for all men. The 1965 Voting Rights Act creates the opportunity for America to properly exercise its status as a democracy. Finally, African Americans can use their constitutional right, and with the vote, they can begin to actually form their own destiny, use the vote politically to actually make further demands on the kind of life that African Americans want in the United States. It's an absolute turning point for African Americans. 
But tragedy struck on the 4th of April, 1968, when Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. It was an event that tore a hole in the victory and progress that had been made in the fight for racial equality over the past decade. This peaceful warrior is violently gunned down, and it is devastating on a very visceral level. There is sorrow and mourning, but there is also anger. The fact that he would fall victim to the regime of violence was clearly too much to bear. America burns in response. I say to you because I'm your brother. I know where it's at. I've been there. Get off the street. Go home. Take your families home. Don't terrorize, but organize. The Black Power Movement grew out of this anger in the late 60s and 70s. And with it came a new generation of young black activists. The civil rights movement does not die with Martin Luther King. Indeed, it transforms. The black power movement is centered on issues around black pride, protection against police brutality, the need for jobs and dignity in work. That every time we yell, the man grabs him and says, everything is okay. He's lit up again. We got to tell. That's right. We got to tell. The impact of the black power and the civil rights movements would continue to be felt for generations to come. Its spirit would come to be embodied in a civil rights lawyer from Hawaii who would ultimately become America's first black president. What an amazing moment to witness, a moment that many African-Americans said they never thought they would live to see. At the time of his election, Obama was seen as the moment when America had finally come to terms with its long legacy of slavery and racism. Now, more than ever, it's apparent that that wasn't the case. Issues of systemic inequality and discrimination remain just as pertinent in the 21st century as they did at any prior point in American history. The Black Lives Matter movement continues the fight to end racism and police brutality that still affects African Americans today. Hands up! Its origins take us back to when those first British colonies started to arrive. Black Lives Matter as a campaign in uh, the 21st century links back to 1619, 1776, 1865. Everybody grieved differently. I hurt every day. Black Lives Matters are reminding us that that promise, that vision of America has never been fulfilled. <laughs> Black Lives Matter simply says, we matter too. One thousand years ago, America was an uncharted land, home to an ancient civilization. We have seen it transform into a beacon of opportunity for the millions who came in search of a new and better life, and have tragically discovered there wasn't freedom for all. But there is something else that has proved pivotal in the shaping of America into the country we see today. The land itself. From the first settlers coming to what they saw as the new world, everything was a frontier. The frontier has been essential in forging not only the physical boundaries of America, but its very character. It's the canvas of American identity, having the ability to make a country from scratch. We will build ourselves to be these adventurers who will go to new territories, produce new ideas, make a new civilization. Americans developed this national sense 
that uh, anything was possible because the land itself seemed to suggest that that was so. But it is a tale not just of new beginnings, but one of brutal and bloody conquest. White colonial settlement in North America is a process that sees the decimation of Native American peoples. The relationship was one of great violence from the beginning. When America declared its independence in 1776 and became the United States of America, this new republic only consisted of 13 recently united white colonies occupying a thin strip of land on America's east coast. Anything west of these colonies was known as the frontier. The frontier as a physical space is this kind of meeting point between um, settlement and this kind of wilderness. People couldn't conceive of actually how large the continent was. It seems just endless. And so the frontier seemed like the space that could keep expanding before us, and we would never run out of space. The late 19th century President Thomas Jefferson was crucial in identifying America as a frontier nation. He had this vision of the United States as this land of yeoman farmers in, in this kind of rural idyll, right, where everybody would have their little farm and a kind of white picket fence. But if you've got a growing population, you need enough land to give everybody their perfect little farm. In 1803, to fulfill his dream of expansion, Jefferson bought a huge tract of land from the French who had laid claim to this area in the late 1600s. This land stretched from the Mississippi River in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the West. It ceded a vast amount of land to the United States for basically a song for $15 million. And it was, it was a land transaction, which is kind of hard to think of now as just selling off part of your country. But that was basically, France was like, okay, here you go. Here's some territory. It more or less doubled the landmass of the US overnight. But what Jefferson didn't take into account was that it was Native Americans who actually claimed this land. Native American tribes had already been living on the continent for thousands of years. The Louisiana Purchase was really the first big displacement of Native peoples, and it was the first real great betrayal against Indigenous people by the United States government. It would have a devastating effect on Native Americans as white American settlers pushed west into these lands. American pioneers didn't see this as a conquest, but a chance to fulfill their destiny. They saw opportunity in the far west. They saw cheap land, a chance for a fresh start. It wasn't just their right to expand across the continent. It was their religious duty to move west and take with them enlightened ideas. Between 1830 and 1869, 400,000 men and women traveled thousands of miles across America on the Oregon Trail to reach these new and promised lands. The Oregon Trail is really the sort of the superhighway that carries white American settlers to the Pacific coast. It is the record of the traders and trappers who were the pathfinders of a coming civilization, making history with every weary mile. It was a grueling expedition across arid deserts, frozen mountain passes, and hostile terrain. Even these hardships do not deter the migration west. It was bumpy, it was rugged, it was dusty, and it was hot. And you were there for four to six months, and there was no getting away from it. And to encourage people to take this treacherous journey, the government dangled an irresistible carrot. The Homestead Act of 1862 sought to encourage white American settlement of the Far West and the Great Plains. What the act did was allow American families to settle in the West on 160-acre plots of land, and if they improved that land, it was granted to them by the government. The white settlers got land basically free, and the U.S. government got to lay out this dream of Thomas Jefferson's of sending white American farmers into the frontier and expanding the U.S. domain of control. Depending on where you settled, it was either difficult or tremendously difficult to sort of carve out an existence 
in the American West. So there was no reprieve for these folks. The Wild West is one of the most enduring and iconic images of the American frontier. Everybody knows the stories, and it's every Western you've ever seen. And it's all about the romantic outlaw or the romantic cowboy. The popular image of the Wild West is that it is, it is wild, that it is a, a land of lawlessness, of violence. It's probably not a good idea to take your lessons from, say, Clint Eastwood's Spaghetti Westerns, but there is actually a kernel of truth in the mythology of the Wild West. The West had a lot of opportunity for people who didn't necessarily want to follow the rules of civilization. It wasn't uncommon to see a murder rate of about one per day. So, it, I mean, it was a little bit wild. Gun ownership was very high in the frontier West. This was seen as a necessity. You needed to be able to protect yourself with a gun. There wasn't as much law enforcement in the West. Vigilantism was endemic. This obsession with guns continues to this day. Gun culture is very much deeply ingrained in American life. There's a positive association between guns and, and individual rights in America. The right to bear arms dates back to 1791, when the Second Amendment was added to the United States Constitution. The Second Amendment ensured that if the British government tried to take over again, Americans would have the ability to defend their homes. We fought for our freedom, and if ever our freedom is in jeopardy again, we can rightfully, constitutionally, pick up arms to defend ourselves and our freedom. So guns have a kind of association with a form of, of liberty that doesn't really translate to somewhere like Britain, where we are, I think, very confused often and troubled by America's obsession with guns. These arguments are still used to justify gun ownership in America today. Americans now own more guns per head than any nation on Earth. A lot of defenders of American gun culture refer quickly to their Second Amendment right to bear arms as a way of justifying gun ownership. Even though the terms and conditions under which the Second Amendment was written have changed tremendously um, over the past 200 years. This is about our rights, and it's a right for everyone. I think the rhetoric has not moved on all that much. The guns obviously have. It's one of the critical tensions. Can we apply a context which was talking about muskets and rifles and things to semi-automatic, you know, weapons? It continues to be a source of division within American society as much as it is also a part of American life. Settling and conquering the West involved the greatest migration in American history. But it had devastating consequences as white settlers found themselves encroaching on land occupied by Native American tribes. Native American populations were decimated by white contact. They are decimated by diseases that colonial populations bring to the country as they have no natural immunity. Disease killed far more Native Americans than even warfare against European Americans did. But European disease wasn't the only threat these communities faced. They were the controlling power across a lot of the North American continent. They roamed free over millions of acres of land. And white Americans wanted possession of the land. The US government called this the Indian problem. So the solution that they came up was sort of herd Native Americans together on relatively small lands that are not deemed all that desirable by white settlers. This was really the beginning of what became known as Indian reservations. There were bits of land that were far too little for these people to move on to, particularly given they were nomads. These are places where they are under control and surveillance. They can't leave these lands. They're basically prisoners on these reservations. But Native American communities did fight back, determined to defend their territories. 
In the 1860s and 1870s, warfare between the U.S. government and Native people sort of spread across the Great Plains. They put up stiff resistance and they fought for well over a decade, but by the 1880s, the writing was on the wall. A lot of these people who had once roamed free were confined uh, to reservations. It was a horrific blow to Native culture and Native sovereignty uh, and Native land rights. Centuries of dispossession have left long and lasting scars on these communities. Our ancestors said all life is sacred and to be treated with respect, and we have done that. We have done our part as American citizens. It's really no coincidence that you see much higher incidences of poverty, of depression, of unemployment in Native American communities. The issues that we see today are part of a legacy of those centuries of displacement and dispossession. Their entire way of life, their whole sense of their relationship to their history, to their land, all of that was stripped away. I can't sum up that devastation. I can't even properly understand it. That said, in the 20th century, get a resurgence, I suppose, of Native American uh, sovereignty and, and, and tribal um, identity. The civil rights movement of the 1960s was not only a turning point for African Americans, but for Native Americans as well. It triggered a move to restore Native American rights and sovereignty after centuries of oppression. That fight continues to this day. The U.S. government owes it to its Native citizens to basically take better care of them. America needs to do more to address these historical issues which are playing out in our contemporary moment. In the space of just 150 years, the population, from New York in the east to the Pacific Ocean in the west, has exploded from 38 million to a staggering 327 million people. The frontier, so long a part of American history, had disappeared. The map of modern-day America had been drawn. The frontier was technically considered closed in 1890, and this sort of sparked something of, a, of an existential crisis in a lot of Americans at the time, because where was America going to find America? America had grown into the most ambitious country the world had ever seen. And with that ambition, came a thirst to find new frontiers to conquer. There were always new frontiers, as it turns out. Three, two, one, lift off on Apollo 11. You had the Apollo program and the moon landing in the 1960s. Now you have, I guess, the colonization of Mars. But I guess the point is, Americans are always looking for this next great frontier, for the next sort of landscape that they can conquer and call their own. And, and maybe Mars is it. 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 Mars